Um, uh, we've been talking about fighting the good fight of faith. It's been very inspiring and very motivating and very liberating too. Um, the good fight of faith, uh, our anchor scripture has been 1 Timothy 6.12, which says, fight the good fight of faith, take hold of eternal life, which you were called when you made the good confession before many witnesses. And we've talked about what this eternal life really means. Um, we, last two weeks, we were uh, really looking deeper into this. I remember that we talked about it, uh, that it's imperative to fight from the place of revelation and uh, that the revelational understanding of God's goodness and God's love is what empowers faith. It's important to understand that God is good and that with uh, God, goodness is not a habit. It's not, uh, it's not a vocation. It is a matter of identity. It's a matter of, uh, it is rooted in his genealogy. So God is good. Not just that God does good, he is good. God does not have a single evil thought towards you. It's because he is not evil. Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper even as your soul prospers. That's what he says in scripture. Every fight of faith is an identity fight to make you manifest what God has already given you because God has already given you victory over sin, victory over uh, death, victory over sickness, victory over poverty, victory over lack, victory over lost, victory over every form of carnality. And um, so you are really not fighting for victory, you're fighting from victory. You are uh, a child of man, a child of God is meant to live from victory, uh, to think from victory, to act from victory, to speak from victory. Uh, why is it important to know this? Because this knowledge is empowering. It is very, very empowering. It's really down to how convinced you are that the word of God is the truth. Um, that conviction and full persuasion is what is called faith. That conviction that the word conviction that the word of God is true and the full persuasion that the word of God is true is what is called faith. Every time the devil comes to you to say you did this, you did that, you tell the devil does his tricks. He comes to you and say you did this, you did that. Therefore, you are this and you are that. So you can really understand that it's it's a matter of the the real target is your identity, is your sense of identity. So he says, because you did this, you did that, you did that, you must be this. Because you did this, you did that, you did that, you must be this. So it's not the things you did, it's not the mistakes you made, it's how the enemy tries to use it to define you. You did this, you did this, so you must be dumb. You did this, you did this, you did this, so you are this. So really what's at stake here is identity, is the definition of you. You did this, you did this, so you are selfish. And because you are selfish, you are not good enough. You did this, you did this, you, did this, you, you are so mean. You are wicked, therefore you are not good enough. So it's really an identity fight. Because human beings, we tend to associate what we do with who we are, which means we associate our performance with our identity. Most people cannot separate what they do from who they are. Most people cannot separate their performance from their sense of identity. So then, if uh, we, then the matter becomes, if we do well enough, then we are good enough. And if we don't do well enough, then we are not good enough. All spiritual warfare has its root in identity. It starts with trying to prove to ourselves that we know who we are. If we can convince ourselves of who we are in Christ, we will not have a problem proving it to Satan that we know who we are in Christ. It's really us that we are fighting with. Glory to God. So your first fight is not with the devil, as many people think. It's with you. It's with yourself. It's with the Adamic nature in you. The Adamic nature that resides in you is fighting with the nature of Christ that also resides in you in your spirit, man. Oh, glory to God. The Adam 
the Adamic nature resides in your flesh. And the Christ nature as a believer in Christ resides in your spirit man. So then they both fight together. You find there's a wrestling. Paul said there's a wrestling in my flesh. The things I want to do, I end up not doing. The things I don't want to do are the things I find myself in. The, the, you see, the Adamic nature and the Christ nature both fight on the boxing ring of your mind. Paul said, I bring my body under subjection. That when I preach the gospel to others, I may not be a castaway myself. We need to bring, the person you need to bring into subjection is you. And let me say this, this kind of message is probably easy to preach to young believers and non-believers because they already are under the internal narrative of, I need to grow, I need Jesus and all of that. But the people who really need this the most is the matured believers who have been taught that everything is the devil's fault. Mature believers who already see themselves as mature and believe things like this are too elementary. And they don't need this kind of teachings anymore. Mm. But they still have give room to fear. They still worry. They still have anxiety. They still, they still are subject to all the things that people who are not in Christ are subject to. Actually, statistics show us that competent drivers have more accidents than learners because of the complacency that comes with competence. Because with some competence comes complacency. The complacency of, I already know that. I already know that. In, in my uh, years of teaching the word and teaching the gospel, I found out that most of what you have to overcome when teaching maturity, the things of maturity with believers, is that I already know that thing. Is that I already know that factor. Because that's what you're up against. So when you when believers see a title of a message, fight the good fight, they just browse over it. Oh, I already know that. You know, when they see so many things, that's that's how um, most of us think. Mature believers are more difficult to teach the basic principles of God, of righteousness and holiness and grace versus judgment versus mercy, God's love, salvation, faith, because they already know it. They already believe they know it. We already believe we know it. And many believers, I also found out, were not fed with the balanced diet of doctrine in their Christian maturity growing up. And they thought they were. And the only thing is that they are not seeing the fruit of the promises of God in their lives, but they don't know why. And we kind of tend to explain it away with many explanations. If you already know it so much, why aren't you having the results and the fruit that comes with knowing God? You are constantly, we're constantly in a warfare. And that warfare is not physical, it's in our thoughts. And it, it is a matter of mentality. Most times, glory to God, one, what God is trying to get us to see, if we can see it, it will change our lives. So, Mastery over yourself begins with identifying those thoughts, those mindsets, those mentalities and paradigms that need to shift. There are paradigms and mindsets and mentalities that God is trying to shift, but that we tend to be complacent. We think that's okay. We think it's right. But those are exact things that God is trying to shift. For example, God appeared to, to Apostle Peter in a dream in the Bible and tells him, to eat a certain thing. And Peter refused and said, no, it is unclean, I can't eat that. And God insisted and said, no, eat it. He says, no, I can't eat it. Eat this, Peter, and says, okay. but there was nothing God could do. God could not force him to eat it. And that was significant of how God wanted Peter to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, but he, his mentality was too strong, his ideology, his paradigm, his mindset was so, that's why it's called mindset, because it is set. It is a, I, I like to see it the other way around. I like to you to, 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 to rephrase and call it a set mind. Many of us have a set mind about certain ideas. 
Peter had a set mind that even God could not convince him. Peter spent time with Jesus the most. But yet God could not convince him about something that God wanted him to do because as far as him to do, because as far as he was concerned, it is unclean. He can't eat it. So the mindset was difficult for to overcome. Even God could not convince Peter to eat it because Peter said it is unclean. What a mindset. It is unclean. And that was the issue. Why Paul, I believe, had more had a, a more open mind to receive the gospel of Christ. And Paul became the one who wrote 75% of the books of the New Testament. He was he could reach Gentiles. He had an open mind to receive from God what Peter could not receive. Was Peter saved? Yes. Did Peter go to heaven? Yes. But in his assignment on earth, Paul was able to do more and reach unbelievers than Peter because of Peter's set mind. The mind was set. He had a mind set that even God could not shift. Perhaps there are certain things in our lives today too that God is trying to move around, that God is trying to shift, but our mind is so set that we can't receive it. It is so important to understand that growth does not happen in a fixed mindset. Growth only happens when you have a growth mindset. To get back to what we're saying, it's really an identity fight primarily because it's a fight to define you from the deepest part of your thoughts. Your thoughts about you first before your thoughts about anything else. Aligning how you define you with how God defines you. Everything else the devil would ever try to do physically and spiritually is to shift your thoughts about you to be out of alignment with how God defines you. So this is a war that's constantly going on in our thoughts. It's not carnal, it's a spiritual warfare. We're not only doing spiritual warfare when we're praying in the tongues, when we're praying in other tongues, no. We are doing spiritual warfare when we are thinking. <laughs> and I want somebody to really get that. Spiritual warfare is not only when we are praying in tongues and binding all the princes of the air and, and speaking over uh, the, the, the princes of the air and all that and spiritual darkness is high places and all of that and the prince of Pasha, the prince of this. It's when we are thinking we are in spiritual warfare because we are replacing wrong thoughts with the right thoughts. That's as much spiritual warfare as praying in tongues. Second Corinthians 10, 15 says, holding every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. He says, uh, the, the, the weapons of our warfare, they are not kind of but mighty through God, you know, casting down imaginations. Those are the words that the Bible, that the, that, that the scripture emphasizing. Thoughts, imagination, and holding every thought captive to the obedience of God. So the warfare is in our thoughts. Which of that talks about the binding the devil? Rather, it's using words like imagination. He calls them, and he, then he says, he calls all of them strongholds. So the strongholds are not the princes and the powers of darkness, even though those are strongholds, but the primary strongholds is the primary stronghold is within the mindset, the mentality, the thinking process, the way we think. There are mindsets and mentalities and paradigms that God has been trying to shift, like I said, but you that we are not open to. Meanwhile, we are trying to bind the devil, bind the devil and thinking that if you can attend more prayer vigils and attend more prayer meetings and, and all of that, and the situation will change. But the, how about the enemy within? Glory to God. How about the enemy within? How about the enemy within? The enemy within has to be conquered first. And when we conquer the enemy within, it is easier to conquer the enemy without. Now, this is what the devil does. Fundamentally, it's an identity fight, like we said. But this is what the, how the enemy does it. 
The devil is good at adding, adding several layers on top of the issues we are dealing with in the fight of faith so that our we are practically never really dealing with the root cause, but only the peripherals and the toppings and the add-ons and the layers on top. For example, using a colleague at work who is difficult colleague, a difficult father-in-law, a difficult mother-in-law, a difficult friend or situation and all of that, he knows how to package those things so that we think the people are the problem. So hence, we are busy fighting with people. We don't understand that we would have not needed to fight that fight in the first place if we really had a great sense of identity within. So the layers the enemy has on, on top is meant to keep you busy so that you're not fighting the root cause. And at the root of it is really an identity fight. Because it's a matter of, that's not who I am, period. It's not a fight against people who malign you or call you names. It's a, that's not who I am or a versus that's who I am fight. Because it's not people, it's not what people do or say to us that hurt us. It's how it makes us feel and how it makes us define ourselves. So the fight against besetting sins is an identity fight. The fight against sickness is an identity fight. He said, that's not who I am fight. You see, sometimes when people malign us or talk bad about us and it makes us angry to the point where we want to fight, it's because something in us kind of, something in us acknowledges that thing and thinks that we need to prove that it's not true. If, if somebody comes to me and says that my name is not Yemi Adelaide and this is not, the person I thought was my, it's my father, it was not my father and all of that, so that me, I'm just going to laugh at them and walk away. That won't require a fight. It's not going to require a fight because my, that part of my identity is not in question. I'm just, it's just going to take, it's just a sarcastic laugh that all that's, that's all that's going to come out of me. Most of this fight is down to a matter of identity. He said, that's not who I am fight. And when you go a layer down and a layer down and to what you're really fighting for, it is the right sense of identity. And some of the right awesome answers that you eventually get to when you go three layers down is, oh, I don't need that acknowledgement. I already have it. I don't need that approval. I already have it. And I already have it from where it matters the most. Oh, I don't need that validation from them or from you or from this or from that. I already have it. I already have it as much as I'm ever going to have it. And I already have it from where it matters the most. If you go down several layers down, you find out that whatever joy that thing is supposed to give you, God has whatever peace, whatever sense of self-worth, whatever sense of validation, whatever sense of approval, you already have it. You already have it. Why should somebody be able to deprive you of something you already have? Except it's not real to you. What you already have is not real to you. That's the only reason. The only thing that the devil or anybody can try or you can acknowledge that, that people, when people try to deprive you of or take away from you, has to be something you don't already have. But if you know who you are in Christ, you know that you already have it. You already have it, and you have it from where it matters most. So it's an identity fight in its core. It's a, that's not who I am fight. Somebody speaks bad about you. It's a, that's not who I am fight. Somebody uh, um, uh, is trying to give you a bad name. It's a, that's not who I am fight. Somebody makes, tries to belittle you, to make you feel less than you are. 
It said, that's not who I am fight. It is an identity fight. Now, I take you to a scripture, Matthew 4, 3 to 11. It says, and the tempter came to Jesus. That's the devil and said to him, Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And the devil said to him, listen to this. If you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, command these stones and to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him, listen again, to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, listen to again, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you on their hands, shall bear you up and go on and on. And he said to him again, the third time, and then Jesus said, get away from me, Satan. And the Bible says, the left him, and behold, angels came were ministering to him. Notice the, the phrase the devil kept repeating, if you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, the devil is trying to ask Jesus to prove that he is something that he already is. And didn't need to prove it to the devil for it to be true. So the devil here is trying to ask Jesus to prove that he's the son of God. Why does he need to prove that to who that he's the son of God? Identity is not a matter of opinion. It's a matter of genealogy. The devil is trying to question the genealogy of Christ and the DNA of Christ through an opinion. If the devil ever tells you that you are not who God says you are, then he calls God a liar. You, you didn't call yourself blessed. God said, God called you blessed. He calls you healed. He calls you forgiving. He calls you delivered. He calls you free. Above and beneath, it says you are the head and not the tail. You are his son. You are his daughter. You are his beloved. That's what God said. Anything else that the enemy tries to say is a lie. It's just an opinion. The devil was trying to make himself important enough to prove a point to about the sonship of Jesus, Christ Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The devil here is trying to magnify himself to the position of a judge to qualify or disqualify Jesus, and Jesus refused to put him in that position. What many of us end up doing is to magnify the devil and treat him as a VIP in the process of doing spiritual warfare, whereas he's under our feet. He's a defeated enemy. And he's meant to be treated as an entity if we really know our identity in Christ. He is already defeated. He asked Jesus three times, if you are really the son of God, because it was really the identity of Christ that the devil was trying to bring a question mark to, if you are really the son of God. And if the devil asks Jesus that question to prove that he's the son of God, why do you think he's not going to ask you the same question? So it's an identity fight, and I conclude with this. You must fight it from its roots. We must learn to begin to fight our fight from the place of identity. It's more than a morality fight. It's not an ability fight. It's not a personality fight. It's an identity fight. The layers the enemy puts on top, like people or colleagues or career or all of that, are meant to keep you so busy so that you are not fighting the root cause. The devil wants you to stay busy with the layers, but not get to the bottom line, not defining it how God defines it not defining you the way God defines you. Glory to God. God has already given you victory. His word is not half true. His word is true. So we, what do we do then? We have to act like the word of God is true because it is true. Faith is acting like the word of God is true because it is true. What, do you, what does it say about you? It says you are the head and not the tail. It says above only are you not beneath. Are you are not beneath. So no matter what the storms of life that may blow, no matter what situation 
gets presented to you, no matter what comes your way, no matter what happens. Uh, oh, David said, I, I will remain confident in this one thing, that I will see the goodness of the Lord. God is good and his mercy endures forever. God will never leave nor forsake you. You know what? What really changes things is not that God said it alone, is that we know it and we are convinced of it to the point where we act on it. So what brings victory is a deep understanding of who we are in Christ, a total conviction of this understanding to the point where it begins to define our thinking every day. It begins to shift our thinking process. And when that is the case, we cannot do without having victory every day of our lives, walking in total victory in Christ Jesus. But the fight must start within. It's an identity fight. It's a definition of you. When you define you the way God defines you, there's no more, there's no more to walking in faith and walking in victory than that. There's no more to walk in by faith and walking in total victory than that.